Okay, starting now. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, final session of the day uh, with Joe Gibson, uh, covering the cognitively rich rehab of the upper limb. Uh, Joe Gibson, as you may already know, is a clinical specialist physio in the NHS and a consultant physio privately. Um, in terms of her professional interests, she lists them as communication, education, all things shoulders, uh, and on a personal level, football, wine, and horses. So nice little eclectic. <laughs> Um, I'll hand over to Joe. Um, anyone who's got any questions, feel free to pop them in the questions tab and we will cover them at the end. Thanks very much. Over to you, Joe. Thanks so much, Matt. And it's just really exciting to be here with you all. I'm going to swap over to my slides in just a minute. But um, first, as you've heard, um, my name is Joe Gibson. I'm a clinical specialist physio working at the Liverpool Upper Limb Unit uh, with an amazing group of therapists and surgeons who inspire me every day to be better and keep reflecting on what I do. Um, and I also work in private practice as a consultant physio with West Kirby Physio. Um, I've got to say a huge thanks to Jack and the team for actually making this happen. It's been an amazing event. I've got more and more nervous as the day has gone on because the speakers have been so amazing. Um, I'm definitely cognitively firing on all cylinders. Now, before I go to my slides, we've got to do a Liverpool. I've got my shirt on, celebrating. I've managed to stay off the gym so I can do this for you first. And then I look forward to uh, getting on with some proper celebrating uh, any minute. So my task in the next um, few half an hour, I guess, is to talk to you about cognitively rich rehab of the upper limb. So what am I going to talk to you about today? Well, having told you Liverpool the champions, let's get down to the nitty gritty. What I really want us to look at is the things that impact our outcomes in our patients with shoulder pain. And we've seen some really common themes throughout the talks today. I want to look at when people don't get better, as well as considering those psychosocial factors, does the evidence give us any clues about other factors we need to consider that may influence our exercise prescription? And then really have a both a top down and bottom up look at our rehabilitation in potentially complex groups of patients. And finally, how that looks in terms of a cognitively rich approach to our rehabilitation. So let me tell you about a patient first of all. This is Jack. Jack's had pain for two and a half years. He's got local shoulder pain. It gets worse with certain movements. He stopped going to the gym, something that he really loved doing. He stopped playing football, again, something that he really loved doing. He generally played in goal. He avoids things. He has this tight feeling. He feels there's something out of place that needs manipulating back into position. He's seen chiropractors, osteopaths, physiotherapists, sports masseurs. He's even seen a doctor and had a scan which was reported as normal. He comes to me with a sheet of 11 different exercises. And when I ask him what his understanding is of the problem that he's got, he says, I don't really know. Similarly, when I ask him the explanations he's been given for his pain, he says, well, something's out of place and nobody seems to be able to keep it back where it should be. So kind of reflect on what you're thinking already, particularly with the themes that have been discussed today already and what that's already getting you to think. Now, if we leave Jack for a moment and we look at if I'd met Jack the first time, the first time I met him, let's say he came to me, he'd done a little bit too much in the gym, which was his original history. He had what sounded like a reactive tendinopathy and just needed some simple things to help him get back on track. If he'd come to see me the first time, what would I have told him? Well, currently the evidence would suggest that you, you know, you exercise, you're eating well, you don't drink lots, you don't smoke lots. The fact is actually, you know what, most patients with a first time episode of shoulder pain can expect a significant improvement in a 12 week period. As long as you do your exercises often enough and frequently enough. And interestingly, in terms of what exercises we recommend our patients to do, as long as they're shoulder specific, bit of a relief as I'm supposed to be a shoulder specialist, that actually it doesn't seem to matter what those exercises are as long as they target the shoulder. So a 12 week period. Now Jack was told in six weeks, mate, you'll be back at the gym doing everything that you want. And we'll start to see the relevance of these incongruous expectations. Now that's a really rosy pet picture. And certainly in non-traumatic shoulder pain, the evidence is pretty clear that currently we're getting around 80% of people better in the short term. However, one, it's not working for everyone. There's 20% of patients that don't seem to respond to our interventions. But more importantly than that, when we follow people up over time, 
anywhere between 40 and 50% of our patients with non-traumatic shoulder pain can expect to have some sort of recurrence or have ongoing niggly symptoms. Andrew Cuff talked this morning about in 10 year follow-up studies that actually we can see patients who still have a level of symptomology. So does the evidence help us? Can we predict those patients who don't do well? Well, there's no doubt patients who will take longer. Patients who have a concomitant cervical spine pain problem are likely to take twice as long as somebody who hasn't. Similarly, if we look at our more degenerative populations, the recovery times are more like six months than the 12 weeks we discussed before. But in terms of the lifestyle factors, we know lack of physical exercise, obesity, metabolic inflammation, poor diet, many of the things that have been alluded to today, that will increase the time it takes somebody to get better, but potentially limit their potential. But clearly, as far as um, Jack's uh, concern, Jack, that I've introduced you to, for him, probably the most significant thing in those lifestyle domains is a lack of sleep. And actually, when we look at our patients with shoulder pain, it's interesting that actually anywhere between 70 and 90% of our populations with acute onset shoulder pain report sleep disturbance. So when we look a little bit more at the specifics that influence somebody's outcome, we can't ignore expectations. Jack went for that first appointment, he felt a little bit tight, he wanted some reassurance and he wanted to get back to the gym and football. Instead, he was told something was out of place, he was told that he'd need frequent sessions of manipulation and he wasn't given any exercises. And he was told that he'd be better in six weeks. He was pretty happy to go along with that until at six weeks he still wasn't better and the clinician changed their mind and said, well, sometimes these things can take longer. Part of expectations is patients believing you and buying in and trusting you. If they trust you and their experience maps the reality of what you've set out, you're on a winner. But as soon as those things are incongruous, and particularly if you show your lack of confidence with respect to that, then you run the risk of losing them. So getting timescales right is absolutely pivotal. And that's where the evidence is so helpful. Under promise, over deliver, always going to be a winner. These things are also impacted by language. So again, if you use very technical, very biomedical language, our patients are far more likely to opt or believe they need more invasive solutions, whether that be injection or surgery. And as healthcare professionals, we really need to reflect on our language. Similarly, in terms of impacting decision making, interestingly, patients with non traumatic rotator cuff tears opt for surgery, not because they think surgery is the solution, but because they have a poor expectation of physiotherapy. So we have to understand what patients expect. We have to ask them that from the outset so that we then set up our education apparently, sorry, accordingly. And what's also key, remember this guy has seen many, many different clinicians and he may tell me they've said all sorts of things that I might in my head think are pretty stupid. But the fact is, there's no point in me just introducing another whole load of information that's incongruous with what he's been told before. I need to help him make sense of it. And it's not just about that. In terms of influencing beliefs and expectations, everybody's got an opinion. In physio shoulder world at the moment, we think we're massively educated because we've decided to stop calling it impingement. For patients and for Jack going on the internet and searching Professor Google or looking on social media, there's still many, many websites that actually use these terms. And we know that these very biomedical labels lead a lot of patients to believe that they need a biomedical fix. Everybody's next door neighbor's dog's got an opinion. They know somebody who knew somebody who had an injection and it cured it or an operation and it cured it. But again, the information that they get from all those different sources, we need to understand the influence that that's had both on their beliefs and their expectations. Now, as we've seen today, as the days um, rolled on, that there's no doubt that increasingly the evidence suggests that psychosocial factors are far more predictors of how bad somebody's pain will, is, how much they'll be disabled by that pain than anything we can measure in our objective examination. And that goes for strength, range of movement. Physically, those things don't have a big correlation with outcome. These psychosocial factors do. So as well as those beliefs and expectations, what else do we need to consider? Well, when we look at poor prognostic factors, there's no doubt that negative pain beliefs is top of the list. And perhaps we underestimate the impact of shoulder pain on our patient population. 
There's no doubt if they have a negative belief about that pain, they believe that something's damaged and for Jack, something's out of position. He then saw a physio who said maybe something was torn. So now he's got something out of position. He's scared to move and unless it goes out of position even more. And he's worried that the tear will get bigger. Pain-related catastrophizing, or as modern pain science would suggest, pain-related worrying is very natural if you have that negative framework for understanding your pain. And so it's no great surprise that if in association with things, those things, you have poor self-efficacy, so a lack of confidence in your ability to do things despite your pain, then again, that magnifies the negative impact of those psychosocial factors. Now, from my perspective and where we're going to go on this journey together is I know I need to understand those things. And of course, my communication is key, but I also need to understand the impact that, that has on my exercise selection and what's going to give me best bang for my buck. All those things we've talked about, those negative psychosocial factors alongside emotional stresses, you know, things not going so well at work, maybe the relationship with the girlfriend's not going so well. All these imp things impact how somebody moves. It's no mistake that when you look at the sporting literature and you look at factors that predict injury, they're more in that psychosocial domain. So an increase in what we call daily stressors. We had an argument with the wife, we crashed the car on the way in, we can't pay the mortgage. Those things are more predictive of having an injury than again, anything physical that we can manage. So we have to appreciate these things and of course address them, but look also creatively at how we can challenge that movement. And I think, as I mentioned before, potentially we do underestimate the impact of shoulder pain. For us as clinicians, we understand that actually very simple things often help our patients get better. But when you look at some of the language from qualitative studies, as you can see on this slide, then actually you see this is in patients with rotator cuff tendinopathy, with patients with frozen shoulder, and patients with non-traumatic rotator cuff tears. And you see the profound effect it's potentially having on their life. And we've heard again several times throughout the day, pain is a very individual experience and our brain doesn't always tell us the truth. It's sampling our environment, it's sampling all the information we're getting in based on previous experience, based on our families and friends, based on how happy or stressed I am at the time, multiple factors that all integrate to give me that individual pain experience. And if you've been looking at this picture long enough, you'll now be seeing all those swirly snakes moving around the place. And actually that image is absolutely still. Our brains make decisions for us and they interpret information in a way to keep us safe, but it's not always accurate. So, we acknowledge that people in pain move differently and we acknowledge the relevance of these descending influences, all these negative um, pain beliefs, this fear avoidance, but what do we do about it? We see from experts like Pete O'Sullivan, they talk about things like behavioral experiments and exposure with control. We talk about graded exposure and challenging people's movement beliefs. But as a clinician, what does that look like in the clinic for patients with shoulder pain? What does that mean with my approach? Well, does the evidence help give us any clues as to what's likely to give us best value? Well, if we look at proprioception and we look at patients that have had shoulder pain for a long period of time, so in these studies, generally six months or longer, interestingly, in terms of joint position sense, there's less conv convincing evidence than there is for an impaired sense of movement, so impaired movement sense. The thing that's consistently demonstrated is a reduction in forced production sense. And you might be thinking, Joe, it's late in the afternoon, I've listened to a lot of lectures, what actually does that mean? Well, what that means is that essentially patients overestimate the amount of effort required to do something. It's been shown in tennis elbow, it's also been shown in persistent rotator cuff related pain. So essentially you get patients to go and lift up a bag or push open a door and they'll overestimate the amount of force required to do it. That influences how they perform a task. They almost preempt and go into that protect strategy because from a proprioceptive point of view, they lose that movement variability. Now, in terms of the cortex, again, depending on who you've listened to today, this has already been alluded to by some lecturers. And again, excitingly, we have some key evidence, both in patients with instability and in patients with shoulder pain that demonstrate very clearly that again, in terms of the longer somebody has their symptoms, the more changes we get both in terms of cortical neurophysiology, but also reorganization and representation on the brain.
Now you could be forgiven for thinking, Joe, what on earth does that mean? And there's no doubt that these things are further influenced by the context of the original injury, the onset of pain, and all those things we've already talked about. But in terms of trying to address movement and choose exercises that are, gonna, are going to give our patients the best bang for our buck, fundamentally they just make it harder to move normally there's a lot more motor resistance rather than that lovely selective movement from inhibition and excitation everything is much more on or off there's a change in motor strategy there are some very common themes between people in pain and fundamentally their load transfer becomes less effective they potentially put more load on the structure that's hurting because of those compensations but also fundamentally that virtual body map that they're basing movement on is inaccurate it's giving them duff information. So think of our Jack with it feeling something's out of place and feeling things are tight and need releasing. And think what it was like when you last went to the dentist and had an anesthetic, a slightly different scenario because we've taken away one of those senses. But think how your brain amplified that information. For me, trying to drink a gin and tonic with those lips is not going to go well. It's going to be a bit messy and a bit slurpy. It's going to be a lot of effort. And that's very much like it is for our patients when we start to get these changes centrally. So that's fascinating. And isn't that great? But actually, what does it mean to our rehabilitation? How do we put all that together? And what do we mean by cognitively rich rehabilitation? Really, it's how do we take that patient on that journey to reachieve thoughtless, confident or fearless movement so they can get back to the thing they want to do. So where do we start? Well, absolute no brainer. Of course, we have to invest in the individual. And we've heard lots today about the importance of our therapeutic alliance, but also the relevance of our communication and that it's a skill that we should try and hone like anything else. It's about building capacity in all those different domains, not just looking at building strength or building range of movement. It's about building understanding and knowledge and giving the patient the tools. But what we do do sometimes, particularly in a situation like Jack, you know, yes, of course, I want to be the person to help him on that road to become recovery. Of course, I want to be feel good because that's why I'm in this business to help people. But actually, don't assume that what they've been told before is actually what they were told. Sometimes patients will say, oh, well, they told me this and they told me that. The patient heard that. Everything they hear, very much like that picture with the big lips or the moving snakes, is interpreted on a background of previous experience, knowledge, culture, all those social influences, as well as those different healthcare professionals. So don't assume. What can you do to make sure you really understand the story? Shut up and listen. Be present, invest in the individual and hear their story. It's scary to know that most patients will only take 90 seconds to two minutes to tell you what matters to them. But most communication studies suggest that we interrupt a whole lot quicker than that. If you manage to keep yourself quiet, or you just meet, meet, manage to listen for a period of time, then you'll be amazed what your patients will tell you. It will feel like forever, but just keep stum for that second longer, you'll be amazed what they tell you. Now, again, we've seen a lot today in terms of negative psychosocial factors, but the good news, guys, is that we as healthcare professionals, actually, if we establish a really good therapeutic alliance where the patient trusts us, that actually we're potentially a walking placebo where trust, optimism, being calm and confident are vital skills that actually get that patient on board and believe that you're in their space, you're in their corner, and that actually you're interested and fundamentally you're going to take them on that rehab journey. Your subjective examination is 80% of the story. Your objective is a tiny part. And that's why we shouldn't feel disempowered by video consultations or telephone consultations at the moment, because you know what? Fundamentally, it's listening to that story and finding out what matters to the patient. So don't rush it. We've got to find the patient's narratives. Again, we get all enthusiastic and we rush in with our biomedical language. We want to give patients solutions. But actually, by trying to do that, often we actually just introduce a whole lot more incongruous information. What we need to do is hear what they've been told. And before I say things aren't out of place or that thing isn't tight, I say, well, and what did that mean to you? How did that make you feel? And what's your understanding? The patient meaning, not what it means to me as a clinician. We assume an awful lot of the time and actually we set ourselves up to fail by not investing in listening to that story and understanding what the patient's been told before, what it meant to them, and then use the language that they use to set the narrative. 
it sounds hard, but it really isn't. And that way we really get to the nub of what the matters to the patient. And we look at the things that actually matter to patients. They want goals that are specific to them. When I said to Jack, what were your goals? What were you working towards? He said, well, they wanted me to get full movement and be able to do this without pain. And I said, yes, but what are your goals? And he said, I want to get back to the gym and I want to play football. That was never part of the plan. And so why would he buy in? Why would he adhere? Why would he be motivated when it has no personal meaning to him? We make big assumptions as clinicians as to why patients have come to us. And if we don't listen to that story, again, we set ourselves up to fail. It's all about their goals, not ours. If you look at the three things that are most consistently uh, associated with positive outcomes, Empathy is absolutely top of the list. Patients want to know that you care and they're in their space. Once they know you care, they want you, they, you to know what they expect from treatment. It doesn't mean you have to do it, but they, you need to understand it so you can reframe it if necessary. And they want to be educated in a way that makes sense to them. So we talked about that, those descending influences, if you like, and all the fabulous things we can do with our, com our communication to modify that. But also what I want to do is for us as clinicians, I think sometimes it can be really easy to be disempowered by some of the experts that are really trying to help us, but the kind of practicalities of how we apply it in the clinic can prove elusive. So how can we take what we understand and about influencing movement on the background of acknowledging these psychosocial factors to actually challenge somebody's movement beliefs, but also use as a basis for exploring movement and building those relationships and getting patients to trust us. Well, whilst for some people, symptom modification seems to get really bad press for me, for me, it's got a really sound basis in the pain sciences. The bottom line is we know from expectancy violation research, predictive processing research, that if a patient does a movement that hurts, we do something that changes is that movement and it doesn't hurt as much that has a massive modulating effect on those descending influences and the fact is information alone is not enough pain science education alone is not enough experiential learning is key if people feel different or experience something different it has a hugely positive effect on many of those negative descending influences and this is where we can really foster self-efficacy remember positive self-efficacy is a positive modulating effect for many of those negative psychosocial factors. So how does that look in the upper limb? Well, really, really simple. Somebody has pain through their movement elevation. What can I do? I can make it easy. I can unload it by making it short lever or I could support it on the wall or I could just support it on a ball. You saw she was making a fist. There's a fantastic connection with the hand and the, sh and the brain and the shoulder. If I get somebody to make a fist before they move, I get a better feed forward or switch on or proprioceptive engagement with that system. If that doesn't work, what do I do? Well, then I can just add some external rotation resistance the posterior cuff seems to get blamed for most things. And again, what I'm interested in, does it feel differently? Not, have I got rid of your pain? How does it feel? And for all of you out there who hate TheraBand and give it bad press and say it's the work of the devil, a little bit of resistance has a great basis in the neurological literature for just changing somebody's movement strategy. This is a starting point to give somebody confidence. It's about the bigger picture of really challenging those negative pain beliefs, but importantly for us as clinicians, give us a confident structure to move through so that we're confident in our handling with our patients. Our tactile cues have the ability to change that body schema. So where I put my hands, I'm not claiming to do anything magic, but it changes that reference point for the, for the patient. Now, Anybody who's heard me talk before knows I talk a lot about the importance of integrating the kinetic chain with shoulder rehabilitation. And again, that's probably because a lot of the patients I've seen have failed previous rehabilitation. Why integrate, for the, ch integrate the chain for the game? Well, the shoulder very rarely works in isolation. And the lovely Ellie Rich who's modeling these exercises here did a fabulous systematic review looking at the impact of initiating our shoulder exercises with the lower quadrant. It makes it more sensory rich, but importantly, it makes it easier to get the local system doing its job, overriding some of those compensatory strategies and potentially unloading the shoulder. So it kind of fits in with this model of disconfirming beliefs associated with specific movements and really giving us a way in by decreasing that cognitive load, if you like, and challenging those patient beliefs.
And if we go back to some of the other things, obviously finding your inner John Travolta is something we'll all be doing with the pub quiz tonight. But again, the shoulder loves attention. If we change the speed of how somebody's doing something, we make it faster. Often we can tap into some of those movements that actually they used to have before, but now they've almost recoded it because of these compensations. End range utilizes that capsule ligamentous structure and the shoulder loves compression. All these things just allow us to increase the sensory motor value, give sensory input to really help the brain. And if you like, recode movement. And that's again where our tactile cues, our vision, making it relevant to the patient. So Jack wants to go back to football. Why not use a football? Make it about a target, you know, tie it in with what he wants to get back to. And we know because vision synapses directly in the somatosensory cortex, if you make it about a target or something task specific, immediately you will actually change one, the frame of reference, but two, the movement strategy that the patient uses. So we see all these different ways of tapping into that fantastic sensory system that, that we have actually gives us a great way in with our patients. Thanks, Matt. I've got my five minute warning on my phone. You're a star. I think we'll be all right. And really what I'm talking about here when we talk about our tactile cues, our vision or thinking about the target and the task is really external focus. And this comes from the motor learning literature. We're very guilty when patients come to me, they'll often say, oh, well, they talked about scapula back down and in before I did anything. That was my preset before I moved. What we know is that for patients who've had symptoms for longer than six months, that means nothing. They'll overcorrect, they'll overfix those scapula because proprioceptively they've lost that reference point. If we actually make it about external focus or we exaggerate another part of the body, whether it be the lower quadrant, the thorax, the head vision, and actually make it about a task, we know from the motor learning literature that that will accelerate learning and make it far easier to transfer that movement correction actually into the patient's function and what matters to them. Slightly more wacky, you know, look, looking at muscle stim, we look in surgery patients who've had long-standing symptoms, we look at chronic populations or persistent populations, there's no doubt that sensory input, whether it be with a muscle stim or vibration, whether that's standing on a power plate or sitting on your washing machine, I don't think we'll go there. But again, vibration has been shown to have a positive impact both on proprioception, but also influencing how the muscle system works before we move our arms. And music, again, has a massive evidence base, both in terms of modulating pain and if it has a positive association, actually how it can influence somebody's pain experience. So you can see all, all this is talking about how we use that wonderful sensory system that we have in a meaningful way to what matters to the patient, particularly when they're struggling to progress with exercises that actually might sound that they were pretty good, but just aren't doing it for the patient in front of us. Now, to go back to something very local, just briefly before I kind of start to wind up, there's actually, interestingly, some really good evidence for eccentric exercise, but interestingly, not because of its strength benefits. If we look at patients on waiting lists because they failed treatment for non-traumatic shoulder pain, there is clear evidence that actually it has preferential effects in influencing muscle recruitment and also that feed forward or proprioceptive engagement. So something to consider. But in terms of making those cortical connections, there's some really simple things that if everything I've told you already doesn't work, really give you a way in. 10 minutes of aerobic exercise, improve your motor one plasticity. Make that system more, um, what's the word, more receptive. You'll have a better learning effect from then doing your symptom modification. Similarly, sleep's really important in terms of actually consolidating that learning. So sleep, having a good night's sleep the night after your physio is really important. But cool things like working the arm really hard at about 70% of MVC, working across midline, all these things light up those cortical pathways in reference to the affected limb. Visualization, imagery, just watching you you do the exercise, doing it at the same time as your patient. Mirror neurons are really cool, but also foster self-efficacy. So we shouldn't feel disempowered. We should actually feel amazingly empowered by all these fantastic ways that we can target that system. So when I talk about cognitively rich rehab, how do I think I'm affecting that system? Well, there's no doubt I'm having a positive effect on some of those descending pain modulatory um, circuits by challenging somebody's movement expect expectation and making it feel differently to what they think. And there's no doubt I'll be having placebo effects, effective effects because of that therapeutic alliance 
and the patient's confidence in me. But also importantly, I'm having an impact on that somatoperceptual reorganization, that perception of body schema and that cortical organization at a central level to actually help the patient move differently. And yes, there may be an element of distraction. It may be reducing the cognitive load temporarily to make it easier to access that movement patterns. But fundamentally, clinically, this gives us some really nice tools and a structure to work through. So guys, for me, cognitively re rich rehab, it's all about the individual in front of you. It's about investing in that communication right from the word go and educating them in a, word that, in a way that makes sense to them. But it's not all about education and information. It's not all about that top down. Don't forget the massive power we have to manipulate that sensory system to change somebody's movement experience and help them make those cortical connections and that movement coding much more easily. We can actually facilitate that process and use it alongside our education and the other ways that we can challenge those negative psychosocial factors in a meaningful way for that patient and never forget it's about their goals, not ours. Oh, so guys, wow, that was brilliant being able to share that all with you. I've been told by Angie, I've got to give you a plug for Best, which is in October, where there's, if you really want to get your inner shoulder geek, there's some amazing people speaking, uh, many of whom haven't spoken today. If you want more from me, um, you can access a free uh, video series at Clinical Edge um, on that link there, which will be available in the... Um, handout um, and I'm, we're relaunching the online course uh, in August but also just contact me on Twitter if I don't get through to your questions today and don't forget we are the champions. So guys thank you so much for listening it's been a real privilege and now I will stop sharing my screen and hopefully get back to um, answering some questions. So I don't know where my moderator's gone. <laughs> Oh, here he comes. Fantastic. Can you hear me okay, Joe? Phew. Yes, I can. I can hear you brilliantly. Uh, thank you. So I'm sure everyone shared a fantastic talk. Thank you very, very much. Um, we'll kind of move on to the questions. One of the questions I sort of came up, Joe, that, that I wanted to ask about was you talked a bit about um, a simplistic explanation to the patient, kind of, you know, not dumbing it down, but making it an understandable explanation. How do you approach the, the talk about, we said about the cortex and the relationship with the neurological system. How do you simplify that? It, for the patient, absolutely, yeah. Um, no, I, I don't over. Sorry. Uh, no, I was just going to say, is it is it something you discuss with them, and how do you approach that topic with them, and uh, again simplify without sort of confusing them or losing them? Yeah, I I just you know I think it's such an important question. I I think for me less is more, um, and it's really what the patient wants to know. I think what I've really learned over the years is that you know before I did a communication module, I I didn't think I was. I never think I'm good at anything, but I thought I was all right and I got on with my patients. Um, but when I went on the communication module, I just thought in my desperate need to help people, I was just giving them far too much information and really not listening enough. And even though I thought I was, there was always this elephant in the room and something that was maybe stopping them getting better. And, and now having learned to just actually, I know it sounds hard to believe after the last half hour, but shut up and listen, is, is giving them the space to tell me. So wherever I can, I kind of reframe it according to what their understanding is to challenge that. And I don't go into massive detail about the brain, but I, I might use, it's like a footpath that you haven't used properly for a while. It gets a bit overgrown and you've just got to make it easier to access it. That might be one metaphor, but I actually really like it if the patient comes up with a metaphor. So if they say, oh, you mean it's like, particularly if it's something in their space or matters to them. So it, it's very much guided by that individual in front of me. So I don't have stock phases, but I also say, you know, it's about keeping your brain busy and interested in, and you like these things. And I think if you look at Mike Stewart's lovely work, we all learn differently. So whether it's visual, auditory, or just being more dynamic movement wise, it's tapping into that for the individual patient in front of us. Fantastic. There's a question here that's come up from Megan Curtis. It actually links into another question I've seen further down the stream, which is around kind of goal setting. So there's probably two parts to this question a little bit. And it's basically around, you know, goal settings very specific to the patient. And but how do you deal with the patients with the unrealistic goals? And the other question that I saw lower down the feed was again, it's kind of similar, I guess, is around those patients that are bouncing round and round the service, you know, with lots of perhaps where they're the, 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 the poor biopsychosocial stuff is is their driver. How do you deal with these patients with either unrealistic goals or perhaps where they you know, the the, the psychology sort of psychology is perhaps more their issue? Yeah, so I reflect it back on them. 
And I think, you know, I think that's why we, we talk that the poor old biopsychosocial model gets a lot of bad press at the moment because we've taken this very reductionist approach to how we apply it in clinical practice. But actually, as a window for patients, it can be a really nice way, whether you use that, whether you use a mind map, but essentially just signposting to people all the things that affect their pain experience. And then that's where your objective examination can be helpful, because if I can show them, well, look, you've got good movement, you've actually got reasonable strength, and yet you've done all this exercise you've done and you're still not getting better, you know, given all the things we've talked about, does that make you think differently? And I think what's really important about your question is kind of reflecting it back to the patient. It's kind of, it's very easy for us to start challenging, but you really need to understand the the belief system that's underpinning that. So, you know, you're saying, to, well, I always get the, will I be able to play the guitar? And I always foolishly say yes. And they say, great, I can't play it now. So that's amazing. But in terms of those unrealistic goals, it's, it's kind of facing them with the reality. So I, for example, I had a guy um, who wanted to get back to high level sport and when I said, how long is it to you since you've competed? He said nine years. Well, clearly we're going to have a conversation, particularly as he's in his late thirties and the sport he does, you know, your career's yeah. over at that point. So, but that's why I, I listen. I don't interrupt. I just get everything because then it's much easier to reflect that back and then signpost, you know, do you really think it's realistic and actually what would be a better short-term goal? And then importantly, planning it out. So they go away with a piece of paper of what you've agreed and what you've discussed. And it's not always possible the first time with some of those patients, you just have to acknowledge that it takes a little bit of time to build up that therapeutic alliance. I'd love to say I do it first time every time, but with somebody like Jack, who's had so much conflicting information, it does sometimes just take a little bit of time to build that up. Yeah, sure. And I guess that leads quite nicely on to one of the top questions or the most upvoted question we've got, which is, again, you've probably heard a lot, but how do we manage this 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 approach that, you know, we're really trying to get to the depths and understanding the patient? How do we manage that when perhaps we may only have 30 minutes, you know, to, to perhaps see a patient, write notes, etc.? How do you deal with that? Oh, yeah. And I, I, I get asked that all the time. It's like, we only have 30 minutes. I can't possibly do this. It's crazy. Now, I, I think one of the highlights, not the highlights, sorry, one of the consistent themes that's come out through the day is that, you know, communication and empathy are like any other skill. You have, you, you can work, some people are naturally very good, but generally you have to work at it to get better. And I remember when I did my communication course, they said, oh, actually, if you communicate better, you'll be much quicker. They completely lied because literally the first patient I went back to, I think I was still there an hour and 45 minutes later on a Friday afternoon, unable to stop this conversation. So from my perspective, it's it's about signposting it sometimes to the patient. So if it's clear they've got a big story to tell you and there there's still more stuff that you think is important, then I just say, look, we've got half an hour today but everything you're telling me is massively important for me to understand because that really helps influence how we go forward. And I've maybe had two patients in my entire career that didn't like that. And I've said, next time we'll look at your shoulder. And actually, generally the feedback is, thank God, somebody is finally listening and wants to know about me and how it's impacting me. Not So we shouldn't feel like we're shortchanging people because we invest in that the first time because that is the foundation for everything that happens afterwards. But I also acknowledge you'll get patients that are angry, they're emotional, they start saying the same things again and again. But again, there's really great evidence in the communication literature that if you really signpost those emotions, that actually you can bring that amygdala right down and actually get the patient back on track so you know I think we just have to recognize that that is the most important foundation and just acknowledge it when we have a patient that it becomes clear that's where our energies need to be the first time we meet them fantastic yeah and a great question from Andrew McCauley um around about what would your recommendations be to universities to develop uh sort of this sort of cognitively rich approach oh we may have lost Joe there. Bear with us a second, guys. We'll see if we can get her back on the stream. One second. Okay, oh, Joe's still in the chat, bear with us a second. We'll see if we can get her video back up. Bear with us, a small little technical hitch and we will return to the questions. 
Maybe I should test Joe's typing skills here and start asking her questions and getting her back as fast as she can. Bear with us a second, guys. Just going to, again, try and see if we can get Joe back on the stream. Yeah. Oh, we're back. Woo! Fantastic. Lovely. Well done, Joe. Recovered. Fun to start again. <laughs> fantastic. And we even got an answer. I managed to get you to type out an answer there. So uh, well done there. That was fantastic. Um, <laughs> so if you're ready, we'll move on to another one, if that's right with you. Of course. Um, in terms of um, changing circumstances in a minute with COVID, things like that, perhaps a lot of clinicians have shifted to, to virtual appointments. How do you think that will have an impact on, on, on that therapeutic alliance with our patients? Do you think it will improve it because we're listening more perhaps and we're moving away from that kind of objective assessment or do you think it will hinder things? What, how, what's your view on that? No, I think, you know, I think this is one of the things. I think, we, I, I think certainly with video it's easier because you can still use all your non-verbals. But I think actually what video consultations really do is they really signpost the importance of your communication. And so <laughs> that wasn't a GMT, it was lemon juice for whoever just put that comment. The GMT is coming soon, I can assure you. Um, so yeah, sorry, back to the question, Matt. I'm so sorry. Gin and tonic right. just completely distracts me. That is my sensory stimulus. Um, <laughs> if, so yeah, so I actually think that for me, I had done video consults before because I have patients who are traveling that want to touch yeah. in, but it really does put a signpost on your communication because if you don't shut up and you don't give them space, it becomes very clunky. So in some ways it makes it easier. And some one of my team actually the other day said, will you do some stuff with us on communication because we're doing telephone consultations. So we haven't even got the visual side. But again, I've found that those little pauses, those little silences, and then the patient starts telling you more or you just hear that change in their tone of voice. And so actually, I just think it actually makes you tune into some of those communication aspects even more. Yeah, sure. And one of the things you mentioned was around uh, you're kind of asking the patient, how does it feel? You know, doing something based on feeling and kind of proprioception. Do you use outcome measures still? And, and if so, what ones do you go for? Is it, is it still what we learn? Is it, is it still using outcome measures that are kind of, you know, uh, uh, numerative in data or what, what do you use outcome measure wise? Oh, so, so I think I don't know when to give a politician's answer. The fact is, in terms of the NHS and the service, we have to use outcome measures, but they're very much dictated by the CCG rather than anything that gives us the best representation of patients. And so we have to use the MSK HQ and we're using things like Collaborate and the Friends and Family to evaluate the telephone service and patient satisfaction. And in terms of research we will use the scores that are most widely used in so way the score whatever but i think if you look at the, the patient's experience and what gives you the best perspective ash seems to align with the patient experience and quality of life measures. but i'm not again it told us to be giving patients and score i see them but I do wonder sometimes that sometimes that in itself can create a barrier because patients then, particularly somebody like Jack, who is increasingly feeling like everything's in his head, nobody can find a solution. It's kind of, well, they're asking me these sorts of questions. Do they think it's in my head as well? So I kind of quite like to just have no out, you know, the first time I meet them, I want to meet them and have a conversation. If it's in private practice, if I want outcomes, I'll do them after the first consultation. 
because I don't want, you know, again, if you look at it, Lisa Roberts did some lovely work of how influenced people are just by the information they get from us, even before they've met us. So if you give people somebody five outcome scores, I know it's important for research, but maybe we need to look at when we give them, because again, in a, in a more complex group, potentially, does that give us a barrier to engaging them? Sure. And a question here from Susan um, Bocchi, I think, which uh, leads on quite nicely from that question, which is, do you use shoulder tests um, or how do you assess the patient when you're considering a sort of sensitized nervous system? Is there still a role for shoulder tests? What's your view on that? Oh, so uh, in non-traumatic shoulder pain, there's absolutely no doubt that things like Hawkins and near impingement tests are an absolute waste of time because all they do is tell you the shoulder hurts and you kind of knew that already. It's why the patient came to you. But I think when I look at stretch tests or global tests like rotator cuff tests again I can't tell whether something's torn or not but again if somebody's maybe a little bit weaker and then I do something to change things and they're stronger that can just be useful one in challenging a patient's expectations but certainly in a traumatic group of potentially guiding my decision making but you know if, if I don't have a pretty damn clear idea of what I think the key problem is at the end of the subjective I need to ask some more questions and so any test I use, I might use some cuff testing. I tend to do it in prone and isolation rather than gross testing. But I, I use my symptom modification really as a basis of my objective. Fantastic. I've probably got time for one more. One of the things that seems to be popping up quite frequently in the, in, in the Q&A is around where would you direct physios or where do you advise colleagues to sort of seek more information on kind of learning about the kind of psychology of pain and, and, and to find out a bit more information. Is there particular resources that you've used in the past or any, anywhere you direct us to go? Oh, I, I just think there is just a multitude of amazing free resources out there that will signpost you to education. So Mike Stewart, Derek Griffiths, um, Maddie Nicholson with a motivational interview. I think, you know, I, I think what's really important and again, has been a consistent theme of not siloing things. I kind of still want to silo the shoulder because I'm employed as a shoulder specialist, but I recognize that the ingredients are the same. It's just how you apply them. Um, so yeah, I would I would go to the Choose Health podcast, Clinical Edge do loads of free podcasts, Adam's podcast. There's so much free stuff out there, and the information these guys give you. So I would just search um, pain psychology. We've had a load on communication today, and rewatch some of the talks that are available today afterwards because everybody's just giving so much great signposting to relevant literature and if I'm honest I read lots I listen to lots of podcasts and that's what piques my interest to follow down different lines. Brilliant no, thank you very much Joe. that sort of concludes the talk really nicely thanks for a wonderful talk you've done very well for half, half past four quarter to five on a Friday afternoon so thank you very much indeed. Thank you, thank thanks you. for having me and thanks so much to all the team it's been an awesome day. Not at all thanks Joe.